Welcome back. River State Governor Nyesom Wike seems to be a man who loves courting controversy. Last Thursday, he counted a fresh round of controversy when he formally restored the benefits and entitlements of Celestine Omehia as a former governor of the state. Now, in case you don't know him, Celestine Omehia was sworn in as the governor of River State on May 29, 2007, but was later sacked and replaced by Rotimi Amechi on October 25, 2007 by the Supreme Court. The Apex Court had ruled that Omehia was not the candidate of the PDP in the 2007 governorship election and should not have been sworn in as governor. According to the court, Omehia was never a governor in the eyes of the law. Now, things had remained that way until now. Wike, in recognizing Omehia as a former governor of the state, personally returned his official portrait to where the photographs of other past governor, uh, chief executives of the state were placed at the government house in Port Harcourt. He also accorded Omehia all the rights, privileges, and benefits of a former governor of the state. So joining me now to react to this is uh, G.T. Ogunye, who is a constitutional lawyer. Uh, Mr. Ogunye, thank you very much for joining us on the program. But let me start by asking you what your take is on this. Is uh, Governor Wike breaching any law at all? Is he in contempt of the decision of uh, the Supreme Court? Uh, obviously, I, I want to believe that the action of Governor uh, Yes on Wike is in contempt of the decision of the Supreme Court. In the case of... Uh, uh, Amechi and Ainek reported in a Iran Weekly Law Report, uh, Part 1080 uh, of uh, 2007. Uh, in that decision, the Supreme Court was very clear uh, that uh, in the election of 2007 in River State, the governorship election, that uh, Celestine O'Meara, uh, who was the candidate, was in the eye of the law, that is the jury, not the candidate on the ballot. And that uh, Mr. Rotimi Amechi, who was shunted out, was indeed the candidate of the PDP in the eye of the law. And that he must be presumed to have contested and won that election. Um, now, uh, the implication of that was that uh, although Governor Rotimi Amechi was sworn in on October 26, uh, 2007, uh, the period in which Celestine Omeya was uh, governor was the jury, as a matter of law, uh, cancelled, annulled, so to speak. Uh, and so, uh, by virtue of that judgment, he was never recognized as a governor. And that's why uh, it, it made good sense. Uh, and good law for Governor Ruti Mamechi uh, to stand for a re-election uh, in 2011 and was sworn in for the second term uh, on 29th of May yeah. 2011. Meaning that regardless of the fact that uh, he was sworn in on 26th October 2007 for his first tenure, and regardless of the decision of the Supreme Court in OB and INEC, uh, part 1046, Nigerian Weekly Law Report, uh, 2006, which uh, held that the term of a governor will commence from the date of sworn in, because Rotary Amechi was uh, regarded as being the person who had won the election, indeed who had contested, won the election, and who had been sworn in in the eye of the law uh, from that 29th of May, 2007, uh, he had to stand for an election in 2011 without waiting for uh, uh, four years to be complete. Now, mm. hoisting a photograph and not ending the drama there and declaring that um, Celeste Omeha is being restored, uh, all his privileges, I mean, are being restored and all that, is going uh, too far. And for me, that's contemptuous of the decision of the Supreme Court. Now, uh, by way of elaboration, there are three, and, and, and I know that uh, the politics is, uh, is uh, a phenomenon of high drama, high mischief, and high subterfuge. Uh, and I know that uh, to build political capital 
uh, build allies, even amongst as well enemies and political foes. Things like this, uh, these shenanigans and chicanery will, will continue uh, to, to, to play out. But let's say that the, the three categories of people, you know, uh, as governors uh, or as public office holders, that we can uh, discuss whether indeed their privileges could be restored the way uh, uh, Wiki, Governor Wiki uh, has done. And this three are an impeached governor. An impeached governor uh, will not lose the privileges uh, of being an ex governor, except the impeachment mm. protocols and declaration and what have you declare this so. And this may be challenging court. Because until and unless he's impeached, a governor will remain a governor. That means under the constitution, regardless of the impeachment, the governor will be regarded as an ex governor of that state. And so he might properly be able to draw on it, except he's sanctioned under that impeachment protocols, uh, and then is made to forfeit those privileges. The second category is the category of a governor that was given a certificate of return by INEC, but whose election was later uh, annulled. Uh, for example, Governor Ingege. For example, yeah, Governor exactly. Oni. That's the second category, meaning that until the election was annulled, they remain a governor. And that's why uh, I guess that although that was another political uh, grandstanding of high drama, uh, the restoration of the privileges of the governor of, uh, former governor of the state, talking about Shegun Oni, by, 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 by Ayodele Faoshi, could not be faulted. Why? Because once a certificate of return is given, Regardless of the fact that that governor's election is later annulled, by virtue of the fact that the Electoral Act says that until that person who has been declared the winner and who has been given a certificate of return had his election uh, cancelled, uh, vacated, mm. he remained a governor. So the jury, you can say that, yes. Those who fell in this category could be regarded, referred to as as governor. Now, the third category is the uh, Celestine Omeya category. A person that the court of law had made a pronouncement on saying, indeed, we didn't know you. You are a usurper. You ought not to have been on the ballot. You shouldn't have been on the ballot. And we are going to issue a kind of mandatory injunction against you to annul everything that was done purportedly having your name on the ballot. And that's what the Supreme Court did. Meaning that in the eye of the law, he was never recognized as, uh, as, a, governor. as a governor. Now, yes, now doing this uh, in a clear undermining of the Supreme Court decision for me is, 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 is very provocative. And so if uh, the governor of uh, River State uh, wants to build uh, allies, wants new friends and all that. Things like this uh, do him no good. And in particular, that photograph that has been trending since he, he, he did that, of he himself as a governor hmm. standing on a table or a chair and hoisting a photograph. I mean, you know, you know, you know. It's quite, um, it's quite indecorous, no, no doubt. It's, I mean, it's indecorous and, and despicable. And in fact, it lowers the office of a governor because it doesn't make. Pardon me, I can't see the, the, the sense that kind there of you drama. There, we can we even make. see the governor now climbing the seat and hoisting the photograph. No, 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 it doesn't. In fact, it, it just shows that uh, the drama that play out uh, in the uh, violent drama, you, you, you say, uh, on the floor of uh, River State House of Assembly, you know, is. is uh, a kind of character profile. You know, if you recall that there are certain dramatic personnel, you know, that, that drove those crises uh, throughout in River State. When a governor will stand up, and before you know, maybe a governor would even be throwing punches. Legislators are throwing punches. So the, this governor may say that, what's wrong with this? I've just said uh, a portrait. What of uh, the legislators who are, who are throwing punches and pulling, you know, throwing chairs and all that. So, uh, I, this is not what 
uh, uh, we, we, we need to see in government. Because people may say that, no, we, the substance matters. Uh, let's go for essence. Form doesn't matter. Look, in governance, form sometimes is as important as the substance. Uh, a governor should have a courage. And that's why I say that, yes, you'll act uh, gubernatorially. You should act presidentially. So when you see a governor do this kind of thing, you know, uh, doing this kind of thing, it's, 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 right. it, it leaves one to wonder whether we need to be conducting induction courses, training courses <laughs> for those who go to Bulgaria. You know, I, I'm, I'm saying this. <laughs> Those who employ people will train them. But we don't train our politicians believing that they are mature. That is a presumption that is, is, has not been validated by our historical realities. You, you just elect somebody. Where did you train him? You didn't even vet him. You know, you have an election, and then in that electoral process, it's assumed that the electorate knows what he's doing. Now, as we've seen, it's not always the case. Mm. And action like this you know, uh, actually tell us that maybe our electorate should uh, be looking uh, harder, you know, uh, at those uh, options that they have in every election year to determine uh, the kind of uh, choice right. they will make. Uh, all right, Mr. Jitio thank you very much for your thoughts and thank you very much for your contributions. All right, we'll take another break and when we come back, another topic we'll be talking about on security. Stay with us, don't go away. Every day, every hour, and every minute, news break in Nigeria. Things happen so fast, it's most times difficult to track and comprehend them. But that's what we do right here on DJ360. 2015, would you want to come back again? It's like asking Jesus Christ if he knew he was going to die, will you, come, will you want to come back as the savior of the world again? We do not just help you track the stories, we we'll break them down. Explore all the angles, analyze the issues so that you can fully comprehend the stories and use them to make the right decisions. Welcome back. Let's move away from politics now to security issues. Boko Haram appears to have adopted a new tactics in its campaign of terror. That's the use of female suicide bombers, some as young as 12 in the past three weeks, we have witnessed a series of suicide bombings by female suicide bombers in the northeast of Nigeria. On July 22nd, about 20 people were killed when a young female suicide bomber detonated her explosives at a bus station in Maiduguri, northeast Nigeria, in an attack blamed on Boko Haram. The blast happened near a fish market in the Baga Road area of the city, which has been repeatedly targeted by, by shelling, bombs, and suicide attacks in the past. Another female suicide bomber also detonated her explosive not too far away from the scene of the first attack. Now, just two days later, yet another female suicide bomber, as young as 12, blew herself up at a local market in Yobe State, killing 10 people. The young girl reportedly detonated the bomb in the midst of people at the market. Before now, Boko Haram had used female suicide bombers in its campaign of terror, but not in this magnitude and frequency. And the most worrying thing about it all is that we might witness more. So why is Boko Haram now resorting to using young female suicide bombers in its campaign of terror? And most importantly, just where is the sect getting these girls from. Joining me now to help us uh, make sense of the terrible situation is Captain Ali Omar, a retired military officer and a security expert. Uh, Captain, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Let me start thank by you. asking you uh, the first question now. Where could Boko Haram be possibly getting these girls uh, from? First and foremost, you have to understand something the situation of the girl, girl child as far as northern nigeria is concerned still calls for concern there are a lot of gaps that we have unwittingly refused to address concerning girl child education particularly in northern nigeria and for cultural regions not for religious regions People tend to hide under religion to relegate the female child and her education, but it doesn't make sense because 
if you go into the history of Islam, the Prophet of Islam, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam's wife, was quite versatile and successful. And the Islamic nations have also seen successful women hold positions. Now, these girls, for me, could come from two possible sources. The first is the large backload of uninformed northern girl children, uneducated, who probably don't even have a chance of being educated because of some cultural mentality. And the second and the most worrying one could probably be the girls that were kidnapped may be used. Don't forget. Yes, the Chibok girls. Chibo girls you mean. Absolutely, the Chibo girls. Don't forget. These girls have remained faceless, very suspiciously faceless. People who have parents, people who have peers, people who have classmates, people who have a headmistress don't have pictures. People who were registered to write an exams, the registration, of the, uh, the registration process of which requires, at the very least, a recent passport photograph of themselves, we still don't know them, so we cannot even see them somewhere and say, this is one of such girls. And I still find it very hard to fathom the sense behind having such a popular number of girls remain faceless. So if the Boko Haram, as I have come to understand them to be very intelligent and negatively skewed people, look at this quantum of possibilities I have just mentioned, they will exploit them. Uh, let, let me ask you the next question. Um, but just how worrying, wh why do you think Boko Haram would now be resorting to using uh, girls as young as 12? There, there must be a reason That's what I'm that. saying. If you were to go into a situation like a business, most of the time you're going to use what you have to get what you want. And to source what you want you have to leverage on what your business environment can readily proffer. And where you have a situation in an area where unemployment, unawareness, illiteracy levels are high and almost always absolute with females, the younger, the worse, what will you do as an insurgency group? You are going to entice your female or your victims from the female species of that area. And don't forget, we tend to also naively, very naively indeed, hide certain things we do under religion even when they beg the concept of common sense. The dress mode, for example, the hijab issue, for example, is it doing more harm than good? Women must not necessarily wear hijab, uh, hijab everywhere to dress decently. What happens to the abaya, for example? There are better and more ways of dressing decently, options to the Muslim woman, than this stereotype rigid hijab thing. And for crying out loud, you can't wear a hijab and snap a passport and go to Saudi Arabia. You're going to snap that passport without your hijab on. So you see religious naivety, mm. you see ignorance, and this, uh, these insurgents know it. So they just exploit it. Once a woman wears a hijab and affairs anywhere, oh, she's holy. I mean, let's, I mean, I'm not holding brief for insurgents here. You, armed robbers have used hijabs to rob banks. They walked into a bank in Kaduna wearing hijabs, pretending to be women. And because they wore hijabs, that appended a measure of holiness to them that beat all security pre-requirements. And they had a smooth sail. They walked in and under the hijab were machine guns. Look, being religious is not absurdity, okay? Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said something. He said, where you bring ignorance and religion together, you get catastrophe. And that's what we're seeing. People are just not wanting to question anything that is put under the umbrella of religion. 
So all sorts bring everything and anything and call it religion and the people just swallow it. Inclusive, this idea of hijab, hijab, hijab as a dress code. Hijab is not the only dress option known to the Muslim woman. Now, so, some of these girls are as young as 12, as we saw in uh, the attack in Yobi. Is there a chance also, like, we, we, you know, is, is there a chance now that these girls' parents may also be giving them up as suicide bombers? Because, uh, for a fact, some of these girls are not able to make up their mind on their own. And uh, we know for sure from what we have seen in the past that some of them don't even actually know. Some of them would actually not know what they were going in for. Yes, you, indeed. So, is there a chance that their parents might be giving them up as well? Because probably some of their parents are Boko Haram members. I'll tell you something, uh, Deji. I read somewhere that a mind is a terrible thing to waste. What do I mean? There's a school somewhere in the United States, and that's their, their mantra. A mind is a terrible thing to waste simply means it's not only about the girls. It's also about the parents. Are these parents educated? You see, education is key to the religion of Islam. And that's why when Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam received his revelations, the first thing he had from the angel Gabriel was Ikra. Ikra means read. Most of the parents are no better than the children. They are equally wasted minds. Their minds are blank. And when you have people who have blank minds, anything you write there is what we read. The first person to get to them and indoctrinate them is their version of education. What are our religious leaders doing? What are our traditional leaders doing? Nothing, as far as I am concerned, in terms of equipping these people with the right mindset. And that's what this insurgents exploit that's just what they exploit they come in there and because there is what you call an ideology or a mentality or an awareness vacuum they occupy it and the first there actually masters it so some of these unenlightened illiterate uninformed people the first form of awareness that comes to them is negative this negatively skewed awareness and its perpetrators and its, you know, propagators become their heroes. Because those who should have been their heroes were not there for them. So you are seeing the insurgents taking advantage of the gaps we have unwittingly left untended. That's, that's actually a serious one, but... Just how difficult do you think this would be for the, the, the military to deal with? Because we are seeing this at, at a, a higher frequency and people are saying it's surely going to be difficult for the military to deal with this. Very difficult indeed. And it is just as difficult as it is for us to deal with corruption. You see, the military is a part of a whole and that whole is called Nigeria. Nigeria is a nation space that occupies all of us and we have our attitudinal and uh, if I may call it acculturated ways of thinking and people who think outside the box, people who see it differently are considered deviants even when, when those people are saying things that could actually be the road less traveled which we could follow and get some solutions. The military itself cannot fight this war manually or mechanically. They will fight this war intelligently. No less our religious institutions, our social institutions, and what have you. I get excited when I talk about these things because despite the fact that the issue of insurgency is a bad one for us, it's a costly one for us, it's daunting, but it's also an opportunity for us to grow quickly. Necessity, they say, is the mother of invention. Taking on these insurgents is a cocktail of so many efforts. And much of what we are going to proffer as solutions must come as a result of what you can call intellectual rigor. You must be able to read yourself into the scenario at the social military, political, economic, religious levels. 
And even when you have read yourself into these scenarios, you must also retain a measure of metacognition and imagination. People who know what to do, people who know how to do it, should actually be handling the situation as we speak. Right now, what you see militarily, what you see socially, religiously, seems to be a merry-go-round kind of thing. We are looking at a situation where we keep bringing solutions that beg the problem. We're not getting wiser, and there is a dump load of literature globally from as far as when the al Hassassins, the first set of terrorists, were operating that tells us exactly what the terrorist mindset is. But we shy away from intellectual activity and rigor. Rather, we go into the physical. But the Chinese people put it aptly. Yo Shinai, Yo Shengai. Good thinking, good product. If you want to see good physical results, you have to get it right from the thinking stage. We need to get but, thinking. Uh, so, so, sorry to interrupt you, but let, let me just ask you. How, what, what exactly would you expect the, the military, I mean the, the security forces to be doing at this moment to check this trend? At the very moment as we speak, much time has been lost. So we really cannot afford to isolate the problem because we want to go and seek a solution for it or freeze the time. We have to learn hands-on. Learning hands-on simply means moving the center of activity. When I say the center of activity, I mean the center of the mastermind to my degree. And that is the command center. The command center itself is a pooling house of as much information as you can bring in. Not information on all the things we gather, where they attacked, where did not, they did not attack, who they killed or who they did not know. Information on what you call the subtleties that add up to that environment. What is it that makes them survive in an extreme environment like that? What is the soil topography like? What kind of weapons are best deployed in that kind of area? What is the soil profile like? What kind of vehicles will move faster than that in that area? For example, could we begin to draw a dust map of that area of the country and begin to know exactly what the dust behavior is and how we can exploit it to give our troops the cover and leverage they need to do a good job. That's on the military side. On the immigration side, there is work to do. The immigration has work to do in that command center. They need to go into the villages if they need to even take only one street, get a prototype of what they want to do, then watch it ex uh, what we say exponentially spread. We also need to see the police. The police has a role to play. If we don't bring this po the police force into this, the police force will not grow. We need to challenge ourselves to burn the mess out of us. We seem to be shying away from this. People want to run that operation from Abuja by proxy. It doesn't work that way. Countries that have surmounted this kind of problems and challenges had their generals on ground zero. A general's first calling is the art of war. The battlefield is his playground, nowhere else. In times of peace, we could actually give him an office to stay in. But in war, generals get excited about going to the front. They don't give reasons why they shouldn't be there. We need to have people, specialists. They are all abound within our 170 million populace. We have pedagogists. We have soil scientists. We have professors, sociologists. Look, I can continue naming them. They need to bring in the details of the command center and these specialists will analyze it and give you likely scenarios. These likely scenarios will inform your battle plans, your design for combat, and so many other things. We even need to bring in the logistic experts. How are the troops fed? How are they clothed? In the extreme of temperature, what kind of clothing? Look, heat can just rout an entire army's efforts. If you want to understand what I'm saying, take our footballers to an area where the temperature is extreme and have them play the match that same day, they lose. You need to acclimatize them. We don't have time to acclimatize. So what else can we do that will leverage our lack of time? 
how can we clothe them? Mm. How can we feed them? What can we insert into their nutrition that will give them some kind of resistance to the weather? Hey, absolutely. My brother, there is work to be done. Mental, serious mental work. And it's not for people who have no imagination. All right, Captain Ali Umar, we want to thank you very much for joining us on the program and thank You're you welcome. very much for your thoughts there. Well, that's it on the program. If you want to watch it again, it's simple. All you just need to do is go to our website, tv360nigeria.com. You'll find the program and uh, lots more there. You can also watch us on YouTube by subscribing to our YouTube channel. It's uh, youtube.com forward slash tv360nigeria. Or simply follow us on Google Plus at tv360nigeria. Just like us on Facebook. The address is facebook.com forward slash tv360online. You can also follow us on Twitter. Our handle is at TV360 online. Thank you very much for watching. We'll be back again next week. See you then.